Who's your emergency contact? Who should we notify in the case of death? Welcome to the USP, where I spent the last two plus decades of my life. I'm in that water. Today I want to share a story about my homeboy Rafe. He's a little mini Samoan. He's shorter than me, but he's wide and built like a bowling ball. You know, with little short feet. One of the coolest cat you're ever gonna meet. You know, he came to Atwater from Sheridan. But even though he's cool, he's not gonna go for nothing. You know, he was almost going home when he was in Sheridan. He had less than two years left. Then he ended up beating his celly up over there in Sheridan, a native dude. And he beat the brakes out of him and ended up catching maybe two or three more years. That's how he got sent to Atwater. Now, Atwater, you know, some of the homies try to clown and whatever, and like he's kind of slow or whatnot. But we're out in the yard and, the, and the, some of the homies was trying to clown. But I'm like, damn, if you guys so smart, why the fuck are you guys sitting on the bench on a Saturday here with me while Rafe is out in the visiting room? You know, if you, oh, you motherfuckers so smart and got so much game, why does Rafe get a visit every single weekend from his girl? You know, they didn't have too much to say about that, right? But, you know, I emphasize that the CEOs in the penitentiary get us caught up. I mean, of course, we always have the choice to either react or not. But when you're in a place where you're stripped of everything already, where the only communication you have with your family is through a phone call, a letter, and a visit once in a blue moon. It gets frustrating. And then you're sitting there knowing that you're not going home for however many years. So you try to do your best to cope. You try to do your best to get into a routine and do what you do to make your time as easy as possible. Rafe, all he does, he works in the kitchen. He goes there, cook himself to eat, does what he's supposed to do in the kitchen. From all account, all the CEOs that work with him in the kitchen knew him as just a chill, mellow kid. Don't bother nobody, don't disrespect anybody. Whenever his day off is and we have a game, he always come out, and he's always telling me, put me in the game, coach, put me in the game. But, you know, he's got a little short feet, so he can't really run and chase the flag like, you know, like the rest of us. But he likes to wreck. So we put him on the defense on the line. And, you know, a lot of times he come up with dirt in his hair, but he love it. He love to wreck. And when he get a hold of somebody, they're getting punished because he's built like a bowling ball. All his shit is condensed. So if you're running and he hits you up, you know, on your, and he hits you, you're going flying or you're eating rocks. On this particular day, I'm outside running my poker table. You know, it's in the afternoon, right about before count. So about two o'clock, three, you know, between two and three o'clock. All of a sudden, you see the deuces go off. Like I said, the deuces is a, is a panic button, an emergency response button where the COs hit for help, for assistance, letting them know there's an incident happening in whatever area. So all the deuces go off and they're running over the 3A. 3A is where all, um, where Rave, the homie Sep, Cap, Easy, and the native homie Justin stay. So they're running over there. But all of us out in the yard, we don't know what's going on. So all we see is all the CEOs running to the unit. You know, they go in there, piling up in the unit, piling up in the unit. And then we hear on the intercom, yard recall, yard recall. They're calling us in. Anytime an incident happens and they call yard recall, we already know we can get locked down. But like we said, like I said, 
I don't know what's going on. So I pack up all my poker stuff, whatever, and we all get uh, marched back into the block and get locked down in our cells. Well, at about eight or nine o'clock that night, after count, uh, after count, one of the CEOs is coming to my door. You know, it's me and Semi. We're Sellies right now. And we just kicking back. So he comes to my door, knocks on my door, and he tells me, hey, Lieutenant want to see you. So I'm like, for what? I ain't got nothing to fucking say to no Lieutenant. Man, he wants to see you. I say, listen, man, if he wants to see me, he can come to the door and holler at me. And see, like, oh, it's like that? I say, man, get the fuck away from my door. So he leaves my door and goes back into the office. Five minutes later, he comes back, knocks on my door, and tells me, hey, cuff up. I say, cuff up for what? Because, you know, when you're locked down, you really can't, you can't come out of your cell unless you cuff up. Now, when he tells me to cuff up, that's a direct order. I can't refuse that unless I want to take the team. The team is when they dress up in the turtle suit and come and extract me out of my cell. So I'm like, man, what's this about? He said, man, cuff up. So me and my cell, we turn around and we cuff up. They pull me out of the cell, put my cellie back in, lock the door, uncuff his cuff, and escort me down to the lieutenant's office. So when I go into the lieutenant's office, they uncuff my, my handcuff and put me in a holding tank. So I'm in there in the holding tank, and next thing I know, here comes the big, uh, the older homie, Dana. He comes over there, and they throw him in the holding tank with us. So <clears throat> Dana's looking at me. I'm looking at him like, what's going on? Because we don't know what, has, what happened yet. You know, so Lieutenant comes down there, um, Lieutenant Putin, you know, and I've never had any bad interactions with this Lieutenant. He's always been fair. So, and respectful. And I've always been respectful in return. So I'm like, hey man, what's going on? He's like, hey, uh, what's going on with your peoples? I said, what are you talking about? He's like, hey man, you got just a just a week ago. You know, a week ago, we had put a hit. Well, not us, but one of the homies, one of the Vietnamese homies, Asian homies, had got in a fight in front of the chow hall. I don't know over what, you know, they weren't there that long, but they were beefing with some and they got into it in front of the chow hall. And, you know, they got locked up or whatever. So he's like, yeah, just a couple, just a, last week. Your homie's over there fighting in front of the chow hall, and now you got your homie over here beating up the police. I'm like, what? You know what I mean? Be so now I know what happened. You know, Rafe had beat up the police in 3A. So I'm asking, I'm like, man, what that got to do with us? Oh, well, you speak for the... I said, ho, 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 ho. I don't speak for anybody. So, well, you got to, you know, keep your homeboys in line and... This and that. I'm like, listen, man. I got a hard enough time doing my own time. So what the fuck and who am I to tell somebody else how to do their time? And if the homie got and if the homie beat that beat up a CO, I'm pretty sure that CO had it coming. So the lieutenant was like, oh, it's like that. I said, yeah, it's like that. So all right, you guys are both going to the shoe. So Dana's like, for what? That was for timeout. So they throw me and Dana in the shoe for timeout. I ain't never heard you just go to the shoe for timeout. I thought you had to be, you know, get, get yourself in something to go to the shoe. And at this time, I'm not an official representative or an unofficial representative. You know, for the West Side, Dana spoke, spoke for the homie. And on the east side, we had this um, Filipino homie named Silva that spoke for us. Big old Filipino, you know. But for some reason, they came and snatched me up and Dana up. 
You know, they snatched me up on the east side and Dana up on the west side. So they take us to the shoe. So, of course, we're a little frustrated, but what can we do? We can't do nothing but beat up the police and catch a case. So me and Dana go into a cell together, and I'll share you some of the stories about the old man. You know, he's a good old man. He's just a little burnt out because he's been in there for 30 plus years. And me and him were cellies. Well, anyway, the next day, they take us out to the wreck cage, me and Dana, and they pull Rafe out. And they put Rafe in the cage next to us. You know, once you have a saw on a staff, you can't really wreck with anybody else. But their policy, if you put a saw, if you saw on a staff in the facility, they're supposed to relocate you and put you in another shoe. But in Atwater, there's no FCI. There's only the USP and a camp. And the camp doesn't have any shoe. So when we're out at wreck, Rafe comes out and he brings his shot, you know, what his, his write-up, and he gives it to us and we read it, you know? And um, instead of just telling you what I read, I just tell you what Rafe said. You know, Rafe came home from working in the kitchen. I'm telling you, the homie is a very respectful individual. He don't bother anybody. He works in the kitchen, brings food back sometimes to cook, share with the homies. That's all he, he eats and works out and comes out and hang out with us, whether we're playing basketball or handball or whatever on his day off. For the most part, he just minds his business. So on this particular day, when he comes home, there's this little punk ass CO named Marquez. And he's one of them little dudes that got them little dude, them little man complex. You know, when you look at him, he just looks like a douchebag. He just got the face of a douchebag. But, and he's a douchebag. He's always in somebody's cell, trying to take somebody's shit, thinking that shit is funny because he knows he's protected by the BOP. His courage, his heart is on loan by the federal government. Because anywhere else in the world, when you run his ass, when you run into him on the street, I promise you he's a little bitch. But in there with that uniform on, he thinks he's tough. So he asked the homie Rafe to come out of his cell. Rafe just came home from working in the kitchen eight, nine hours. And when I say working in the kitchen, the homie is really working. He's not out there just hanging out in the kitchen, trying to plot and steal. He's working. All the staff that work with him in the kitchen like him because he's respectful and he does his job. So he asked Rafe to come out the cell and he shakes down Rafe's cell. And he comes out with a manila envelope. Well, in the manila envelope is some uh, black and white pornographic. We call it Fiend. You know, in 96, they stopped letting us get... Uh, Pornographic uh, magazines like Playboys, Hustlers, Triple X, whatever. Uh, all the other different names and stuff, right? But in 96, the BOP adopted this policy and they called the Zimmerman Bill. It was just a, it was a bill. It was never passed into law. But the Attorney General at the time, I think Janet... Uh, Janet Reno adopted the bill and made it a policy in the BOP to stop letting us have pornographic uh, images because they, they said that, you know, these guys over here have these pornographic video uh, magazines and then they're out there working out on the weight pile. And when they come home, they're all big and buff and raping women, which is a damn lie. The violence, the sexual predators has increased since they've taken those magazines from the BOP. Now, instead of a dude going in there, you know, getting his nut off, looking through a magazine, he's out there jacking off on female staff. 
or raping other dudes. Like, you can say whatever you want, but we're all, we're all a sexual creature. And when you're confined in a space without release, you need to find avenues to do that. Some people can cope it better than others. You know, it's sad that this, the environment breaks us down to like, we're nothing but animals. Well, anyway, so Rafe tells me, yeah, I say, hey, why are you taking my, my, my fiend? Oh, you can't have this. Yeah, of course we can't have it. But who is it bothering? It's a black and white photocopy of another black and white photocopy that's being passed down through decades in the penitentiary. And you know, every time somebody comes to your yard with a new image, somebody wants to go fo photocopy it and sell it to people on the compound. You know, it's like a third, fourth generation copy. My point is, it doesn't, it's not bothering nobody. This is for, this is own personal shit. So Rafe tell me, he's like, hey man, let me have my, let me have my stuff back. And the CEO is like, ha ha, you can't have this. And then Rafe says, like, yeah, he was laughing at me. So when he was laughing at me, the thought I had was like, oh, this guy like wants to have workers comp. I was like, what? He goes, yeah. I think he wanted a workers comp because he was sitting there laughing at me. So Rafe knocked him out. Cold. Hit him one time. I'm telling you, Rafe is shorter than me, but he's wide and he's a tough motherfucker. So he knocks uh, Marquez out, out cold, sleeping on the floor. Then Rafe walks around the unit, tells everybody, hey, you guys better grab your ice and your water. You know we're gonna get locked down. He walks around the unit, comes back, wakes up Marquez, wakes him up, pull him up, put him on his feet, knocks him out again. He falls down, he's laid out. This is what I was told, you know, he was telling me, but it was the same thing that was written because they got cameras in the unit. So he knocks out Marquez a second time. Walks around the unit again, takes his little lap, letting everybody know, hey, you guys better get your commissary, get your ice and your water. You know we're gonna be locked out for a minute. He walks around the unit, comes back, wakes him up again. You know, wakes up Marquez again, put him up on his feet, and knocks him out again. <laughs> you know, I'm laughing when he's telling, I'm having the same reaction I'm having now. I'm like, what the fuck, Rafe? He's like, man. He wanted a worker's comp, so I gave him worker's comp. And that's what it is, like, you know, so after the third time, that's when all the COs came in and whatever into the block to secure the homie. But my point, and anybody that knows Rafe, that he's a humble individual. He don't bother nobody. He was trying to do his time. And this little bitch ass Marquez Came and fucked with them. Yeah, you can't have those images. But really, where is that image worth you getting knocked out three times? Especially when it's not out in the day room, it's in his locker, put away. That's for his personal, you know, use. Not bothering anybody. So, again, when they go to court, the only thing that's gonna come out of that bitch's mouth is, I was just doing my job. But you weren't. You went over there to go fuck with an individual on purpose. Because you see, he was cool, he was quiet and mellow, and you thought, yeah, you got somebody you can pick on until your bitch ass got knocked out. We're just trying to do our time. We got decades to do. Let us do our time. Leave us the fuck alone. Any shit that doesn't cause you any harm. Yeah, if it's knife and drugs, I understand. But everything else, man, have some fucking common sense. You know, but at the end of the day, 
the homie got screwed. He he had a, less than two years to go home, and he ended up with seven more years. You know, all these people, man, they think because we're in prison that we're all piece of shits, but we're not. We have standards, and at a certain point, we get enough. You know, we have enough, and we're gonna do something. You keep pushing that bear. You keep poking that bear. You can get it. And we don't violate kids. We don't violate women. We don't tell on people. Welcome to the USP.